men and women of Australia, we are at war with Japan. I'm sure they're going to go on up there, you know. I really should have. There were so many acts of bravery there. Like the rest of us, to, to stay there and fight to the finish. G'day, David here from Kokoda Historical and welcome to episode 5 of Kokoda Cast. Hope you're enjoying the series. We're hoping to bring lots more great stories about the fighting in Papua New Guinea, both in the First and Second World Wars. And it's not always going to be about Kokoda. There's a lot to Papua New Guinea. And hopefully as we go through, I can highlight some of these probably little known pieces of history that uh, b- pertain to Australia's involvement with Papua New Guinea in times of war. Now today on episode five, we're going to have a very special guest and it is best-selling author and historian Philip Bradley, written many books, including Hell's Battlefield, which uh, a lot of uh, you may have received from Kokoda Historical if you've ever trekked with us. But uh, he did write a book, a wonderful book called On Shaggy Ridge, first book that I ever read of Phil's, and it sort of certainly got me interested in the campaign and going to Shaggy Ridge and subsequently leading treks there. Before we hear for Phil, let's uh, take a look now and talk about the history of Shaggy Ridge because a lot of our listeners may have only heard the name or may not have heard the name at all. And you've got to think to yourself, after 65 days of fighting during September and October of 1943, the Japanese had been defeated in the Finchhaven area and they had no choice but to retreat northward. The 9th Division pursued the Japanese along the coast and the 7th Division, these are men, many men that had fought previously in Kokoda, they waited on the other side of the Finisterre Range, preparing to assault Shaggy Ridge and enabled them to join and link up with the 9th Division at Bogajim. Now the ridge was named, everyone asked me, what's, why Shaggy Ridge? Well, the ridge was actually named after SX3169 Captain Robert Shaggy Bob Clampett, who had previously served in the Middle East and home in Australia and, of course, in New Guinea. And he was with the 22nd, 27th Battalion. And as commanding officer of a company of that battalion, Captain Clampett played a leading role in the defence of Shaggy Ridge. And subsequently, that particular part, I guess, of, of the feature was named after him, and which was Clampett's nickname. Now, on the morning of 27 December 1943, before the infantry attack, it was a three and a half, around three and a half thousand artillery shells fired from 25 pounders went up through the valley and they were backed up by a squadron of Australian boomerangs with American man Kitty Hawks and shells and bombs were launched at every Japanese strong point. Now B Company of the 2nd 16th Battalion, again one of the battalions in the 21st Brigade, who we know from their fighting in Kokoda, they had attacked up here just after 9am and they'd clambered up the up the slopes and they were surrounded by artillery fire and they quickly captured the pimple and pushed on for another 100 metres to capture the next knoll along the ridge. Now B Company of that battalion was subsequently relieved by D Company and they renewed the attack the next day and captured two large knolls along the ridge. The Japanese counter-attacked that afternoon but they were beaten off and thereafter were content to shell the Australians newsly won position with a mountain gun. Of course, the Japanese with their mountain guns. And the Japanese had fought hand to hand and from dugout to dugout. And the Australian attack was halted near the summit of the pimple where a strong Japanese pillbox barred their approach. A day later, the pillbox was blasted by high explosives supplied by engineers. And by the morning of 28th December 43, the Japanese had been thrust from the pimple, but they'd still held the northern slope of Shaggy Ridge. And the next major assault, codename Operation Cutthroat, would be launched by the 18th Brigade with the aim of capturing the entire feature, including the Japanese stronghold at Kinkairo Saddle. Now the plan involved the brigade's three battalions covering on the saddle from three different directions. The 2nd 12th would advance from a place called Canning Saddle, east of Shaggy Ridge, and attack Kinkairo Saddle via two well-defended knolls on the northern edge of Shaggy Ridge, known as Prothero 1 and 2. And the 2nd 9th, they would attack northwards along Shaggy Ridge itself, and the 2nd 10th, the 3rd Battalion within the brigade, would advance along the Faria Ridge, which lay to the east of Shaggy Ridge, and joined it at Kinkairo Saddle. Those places in particular 
feature on our trek when we go to Shaggy Ridge. And some of you who have trekked with us may have all this come back. There's lots of detritus in the jungle, lots of things to see. Now, back in 43, all of those three battalions were going to be supported by artillery and allied aircraft. And the 2nd, 10th and the 2nd, 12th, 12th battalions commenced their approach on the 19th of January, 1944. And the 2nd, 12th in particular had a great deal of steep and, and really hard country to traverse. And they were not scheduled to attack for another two days. However, on the 20th, the 2nd, 10th attacked Japanese position on Cam Saddle in order to fight their way up onto Faria Ridge itself. But they were held up by stubborn Japanese resistance. And, the op and as the operation began in earnest the following morning, the 2nd 12th clambering up the steep slopes below Prothero 1 and A Company of the 2nd 9th doing the same on the eastern side of a place called Green Sniper's Pimple. And they reached the highest point of both McConey's Knoll and Shaggy Ridge itself. And the unexpected direction of these attacks up the slopes had, you know, got the Japanese obviously they'd regarded it as a place as being impassable. So they were shocked about this, right? And the Australians, they quickly established a foothold on both features and were secured by the end of that day. And their new counterparts had to withstand several counterattacks and persist in accurate artillery bombardment. And the second tent's own artillery support had helped it to force its way onto Faria Ridge. And earlier in the day, they had achieved that. However, by nightfall, it advanced to within a kilometre and a half of Kenkaro Saddle. This is a Japanese stronghold. And on the 22nd of January 1944, it resulted in another day of hard fighting. In fact, the 2nd 12th Battalion pushed south along Shaggy Ridge to capture Prothero II, while the 2nd 9th pushed north to take the rest of McCorney Snow. And after the two battalions readied themselves to meet the inevitable high time counterattacks, which separated them only by about a kilometre. It could have gone either way. But the next morning, patrols encountered little opposition. And by midday, this is the following day, the 2nd, 12th and the 2nd, 9th had managed to link up. Shaggy Ridge was in Australian hands. The 2nd, 10th had attacked both north and south along Faria Ridge on the 22nd of January, had continued to do so on the 23rd as well. In the north, it was held by another strong Japanese position and that was not occupied until late on the afternoon of the following day, the 24th of January. Now, by this time, the remaining Japanese stronghold in the area was atop a knoll, and it was just northeast of King Cairo Saddle itself. And that place was known as Crater Hill. And it was a former Japanese regimental headquarters, and the, def and the defences were well sited and constructed by the Japanese. And it was decided by the Australians that rather than attack this position, the 18th Brigade would contain it with patrols and then pound it with bombs and artillery to inflict sufficient casualties that a final assault could be conducted at minimal cost to the Australians. Now this siege lasted until the 1st of February 1944 and when a company from each of the 2nd and the 9th, 2nd, 9th and 2nd, 10th Battalions advanced up Crater Hill, they found it completely devastated and of course unoccupied. And the capture of Shaggy Ridge, though, had cost the 18th Brigade 46 men killed and 147 wounded. However, it inflicted over 500 casualties on the Japanese, including 244 confirmed deaths. This, of course, would go on to clear the way for the advance of the Australians into the fin Finisterre Ranges to the North New Guinea coast to link up with Australian forces and American forces advancing from the east and thus complete the capture of the Huon Peninsula. So without further ado, let's welcome Phil Bradley to the show. Thanks, David. Good to be here. Excellent. Now, Phil, today we're going to be talking about Shaggy Ridge. I've been there many times. I guess it's the continuation of the story if you move on from Kokoda. But for the listener back home, I guess, unlike uh, Kokoda, Shaggy Ridge doesn't get the attention that it probably deserves. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's, un it's understandable given the um, amount of material written on Kokoda, and, and the Kokoda story is a very engaging one. But um, I, I sort of got more attached to Shaggy Ridge because my father fought up there during the war, and I went back to live in New Guinea. I went to live in New Guinea for a couple of years in the 90s and went up there and got really uh, interested in the story and wanted to come back and buy a book about it, but no one had written anything about it, so I ended <laughs> up uh, interviewing all the veterans who were up there and, and wrote a book about it. So. Yeah, it's pretty close to my heart personally. Um, 
it's also quite an amazing, as you know, if you've been up there, it's, it's quite an amazing feature uh, just to be able to walk along it, let alone think about the battles that were fought up there. Oh, the scenery is remarkable. Unlike Kokoda, you're not under canopy all the time. You can look out and have this wonderful view. So it's magnificent from that point of view. But we'll come to that soon. I just want to touch on you. I'm really interested. You know, you say you got in, in into it from the stories of your father. I'd really like to explore that just for a moment if we can. I got into this through, I didn't have a father. I grew up with my grandfather and he told me the stories of New Guinea. That's how I got into it. So what, what was the, did, what did the, was it a young age that you got captured by it? Or what, what sort of things did you learn from your father? Well, my father died when I was very young. I was only 13 when he died, so I didn't know a lot about the war from him. Uh, he didn't talk about it much. We used to go to the brigade picnics in Sydney. Um, he was a member of the 2nd 27th Battalion, uh, part of 21st Brigade. Of course, you'd know them from Dakota. Yeah. Um, second, he joined up as a reinforcement. He was from Sydney, so after the losses they had on the Dakota uh, track and at Gona, they rebuilt the battalion, and a lot of men came in from other states, as with the other battalions in the 21st Brigade. So Dad went over, with the, he trained with the 2nd 27th Battalion. His first campaign was up in the Ramu Valley. So after he died, he, he left, I had a few books. I had the history of the battalion, and also he had this big picture book from, New, from those uh, 1943 campaigns in the Ramu Valley and also at Finchark, and I had a photo of him in it, um, which he had annotated with a small uh, letter. He'd sent this home to his sister, probably in 1944, um, after the campaign, when the book came out. And it, and it talked about, it was this beautiful picture of him climbing the climbing up Shaggy Ridge and um, with the Ramu Valley in the background. And um, it had the names of the men in the in the unit. And um, so I always wanted to go there because of that wonderful photo. And then I remember as a kid, uh, as a younger guy, going down to uh, the Australian War Memorial. I used to have this massive... This big photo of Shaggy Ridge, the famous one of all the men up on Green Sniper's Temple after it was captured. And I always looked at that and I'd stare at it for ages and just think, wow, how did they fight up there? So when I got the opportunity to work in New Guinea in the 90s, I, that was the first place I wanted to go to and I, um, I did so. Wonderful. And I guess uh, in, in part, I guess you honour your father's legacy by continuing the story on. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, for sure, going up there and and sort of going in his footsteps, I guess. He wasn't, he didn't get involved in much of the fighting actually on top of the ridge, but he was involved in fighting in other areas. But, but that photo of him walking up on the ridge um, was pretty special. And then I later discovered in the War Memorial that there was one that followed it, which was a close-up of him and his mates up on the, up on the ridge. So, uh, that was pretty special, having that as a, as a background to, um, to push forward with the, um, what I did initially, I did the magazine article for a magazine called After the Battle. And then um, I did the book. Wonderful. Okay, so Phil, for the people listening who probably heard the name Kokoda, don't know much about Shaggy Ridge, let's let's just set the scene here. So, we're, and we're going to follow, I guess, some of those same guys that fought with the Seventh Division on on the Kokoda in the during the Kokoda campaign, I should say. What's let's pick up the story. The Kokoda campaign finishes, and what's next for these guys? Okay, so the Kokoda campaign basically finishes with the battles for the uh, Papuan beachheads. So that finished uh, basically the beginning of February 1943. Um, so at that time, the Japanese had been forced out of uh, Papua, which is basically the area south of the uh, Owen Stanley Ranges. Uh, they were still um, they still had bases up in Ley and Salamoa, north of the Owen Stanley Ranges, and obviously at Rabaul, and then further up um, along the coast at Madang and Weewak. Um, so they still held the northern part of New Guinea. So the next phase of the uh, what we call the Australian operations to um, move forward in 1943. They came under a, an American plan, which was called Operation Cartwheel. And this envisaged um, capturing Ley and moving up towards um, uh, basically cutting off uh, Rabaul. At that stage, they had a plan to, um, to, to take Rabaul, but after that, they decided they would just cut it off and, and go further. So as part of that, the Australian 9th Division and 7th Division were sent to capture Ley, which they captured at the uh, middle of um, September 1943. And following that, uh, the Australian 9th Division moved on to Finsharpen, which was further further east and north. And then the Australian um, 7th Division moved up the Ramu, Markham and Ramu Valleys uh, at the end of September into October 1943 to capture the airfields, which would push forward. And then Shaggy Ridge is basically the at the end of that uh, Ramu Valley, which protected the airfield, so that was where they uh, finished their fighting. And then and basically stuck there for four months, yeah. 
do you, what are the stories of, or not the stories, rather the individuals whom a person who has read on Kokoda or uh, who knows something about that campaign, because I try and tell people, you know, Kokoda gets you in in terms of being interested in in the fighting in New Guinea, but some of these great characters, I guess, that we, we read about in the books, they continue on. What can you tell us about some of those guys and have you interviewed them over the years? Yeah, well, there's, there's some who... Um continued on from the earlier campaigns and they uh, most of those moved into senior senior NCO positions or officers. Um, then there were the higher officers as well. General Basie, who commanded the 7th Division, he'd taken over command of the 7th Division, as you know, on the Kokoda track at the end of the, near the end of the campaign. And then he, um, his, the unit fought in the beachhead battles. Then it had to be rebuilt. And so he then took the division to to the Ramu Valley for the Ramu Valley campaign. So he'd be your first guy. The brigade commanders, uh, General, um, sorry, uh, Brigadier Ether was the uh, commander of the 25th Brigade. Brigadier Doherty, 21st Brigade, he took over at Dona. What's the other brigade there, 25th, 21st. And the 18th Brigade was, um, it used to be General Wood, um, Brigadier Wooden's Brigade, but uh, he went on to command 9th Division, so it was taken over by Brigadier Chilton. Uh, so if you move down the list into the battalion commanders, some of the battalion commanders that um, were new. Um, my dad's battalion commander was new. He'd come over from staff as a staff officer. Um, there were there were guys further down the list. One, one that takes that, that I concentrate on a lot because I knew the family very well was a fellow called Lindsay Bear, uh, and he was part of the second 14th battalion. And he fought at Isarava with uh, Bruce Kingsbury. In fact, uh, when Bruce Kingsbury uh, was awarded his VC, he was using the Bren gun that uh, Teddy Bear was wounded. He handed it over to Bruce Kingsbury. So he went on to lead the... Uh, he was a battalion sergeant... Uh, sorry, a platoon sergeant uh, during the battles around Shaggy Ridge and was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal up there. So he continued his, his work. And the, the other section commanders that day were guys... Um, called um, Fido Silver and uh, Bluey Whitechurch. They were also they were awarded military medals. So there's a couple that um, moved through that, that served in all the campaigns. Um, there's probably more. Bob Johns is a fellow I knew well. He was a, um, they named Johns Knoll after him, which is probably the biggest battle of the Ramu Valley campaign, where his platoon fought off something like 200 Japanese. So he had been a sergeant um, in Syria with the 2nd 27th Battalion, and he had a lieutenant by the time he got to Gona. Uh, he'd, um, he was wounded at Gona and then he uh, took over the platoon in, um, in the Rami Valley. So I, and I knew Bob quite well, um, interviewed him a number of times. There's what? other fellas like the independent company uh, commander, Gordon King, who was in charge of the 2nd 6th Independent Company, and he had served at Buna, uh, and then he had taken over the company for the Rami Valley campaign. And he'd, it was his company that captured Fire Pit, which was at the start of the campaign. Um, company of some, no, they probably had about 170 men on the ground on the day um, they killed some 250 Japanese and captured Kaike. And that was the start of, sort of made the campaign develop. So that's, that's, a, few, that's a few of the men who were involved in both, uh, both campaigns. Yeah, well, I thought it was a good segue because especially men like Lindsay Teddy Bear, uh, I, I didn't never met him, but I met, met the family. I knew them through the anniversary exhibitions at the Shrine and uh, obviously Noel bear and and talking to the sun you know all those uh, wonderful stories that come out so i guess for the listener back home there's somewhat of a continuation there and this is the next installment if you will so let's let's go to the the battle now and kai pit you mentioned this is the start of it what 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 happens here so when after Lay was captured um the idea was for the um for the 7th Division to advance uh, advance west up the Rame, uh, Markham and Ramu Valleys. Now, there's no roads and there's these big rivers which cross the valley. So the idea was to try to do it in, um, if possible, make the first hop using uh, transport aircraft. But to do that, they would have to, have to capture an airfield, and the, and the nearest airfield was Fire Pit. So the men of the 6th Independent Company, they boarded, they boarded 13 planes in Port Mosby. They flew across and they landed on the west bank of the east of Fire Pit about 20 kilometers and landed, they, they basically crash landed the aircraft. So Phil, we'll go now and talk about the actual battle of Shaggy Ridge and the start of the Shaggy Ridge, of course, as you mentioned before, is Kaya Pit. Let, let's, take, let's take it from there and move forward. Okay, the, the Kaya Pit operation began in Port Mosby. They flew across in 13, um, 13 transports and landed uh, between um, basically Nadzab, which is Lay, and um, Kaya Pit. 
a place called the Leron River. And it landed on the west bank so they then didn't have to cross it, cross the river. So they uh, landed 13 aircraft there. Two of them two of, two of them were damaged, so they couldn't get off. And then the, the uh, commandos um, established themselves. Uh, and then the next day they uh, went on to Kai Pit, captured Kai Pit from about 20 or 30 Japanese that were there. Um, lost a few men in that battle, but captured the fire pit, so we're ready to prepare the airfield the next day. What they didn't know is that a force of about 250 Japanese was coming uh, towards them from the west and arrived uh, in the early morning hours of the next morning. And um, they they came straight into the Australian perimeter, not expecting the Australians to be there. So the Australians um, actually had the perimeter and attacked the Japanese before they could prepare themselves. Australians lost about, in that battle, lost about 16 men, but Japanese lost about 250 men. But what it meant was that Kai Pit uh, Airfield was then established in um, the 21st Brigade flew into Kai Pit, and then they advanced up the Rahmu Valley from there. So it was a really important action in, in terms of, one, stopping the Japanese counterattack, which was heading down towards Lai, and also uh, preparing the airstrip for the advance up, up into the Rahmu Valley. And so once they were able to secure those... Airfield. So this this now gives the Australians the opportunity to be able to bring men and equipment in and go for that push up into Shaggy Ridge. So maybe let's just follow it from after the infantry guys get in there, the brigades get in there and start to make their move on, on Shaggy Ridge. I guess firstly, why what was important about the feature up there? The Shaggy Ridge itself wasn't that important early on. The, the aim of the initial advance was to secure airfields for the American Air Force from which they could then... Uh, prosecute the uh, air offensive further up the coast towards Weewak and Hollandia. So the idea was to capture these airfield uh, airfield sites and then they would fly in um, airborne engineers to prepare them. So the next area they captured was uh, basically where the Rami Rivers and, and, and um, Markham River uh, meet. It's basically the headwaters of both and it's quite dry ground, quite flat ground, perfect for airfields. So the US 5th Air Force would, would build a couple of airfields there and so the Australians had to secure those airfields by advancing further up into the valley and then they to a place called Dumpu, which was a small airfield, and that's where they would um, they would basically stay in that position then uh, at the end of the year. Simply because there weren't the resources at that stage to support both the 7th Division and 9th Division, which was advancing up from Pinchar. That's uh, Shaggy Ridge is basically the largest feature in that area. So once they pushed into the mountains, just to su- they're basically securing the valley by capturing the, the foothills. And then uh, as they moved into the foothills, they realised Shaggy Ridge was the largest uh, feature in the area. And then as they captured that, or at least captured the end of it, to stop Japanese observers from observing into the Rama Valley, the area wouldn't be secure. And I guess... For people who haven't been there, the thing that strikes me the most is when you get there, unlike trekking Kokoda or doing that, when you start to make your way up, it's very, very, it gets very steep very quickly. What do you know what lessons that the Australians, if any, had they taken in to do? We had on our uh, previous episode about the equipment that the Australian soldiers had. Do we know what, what lessons did the Australians take or did they not have time after coming, you know, I guess reorganising back in Australia and then coming back up? To do this campaign, what, what what did they take into it from their experiences in in Papua? Well, I think the first thing is that they they were lighter equipped than they were when they went into the Papuan campaign, if you like. They were um, they still had their um, you know the heavy the the beauty not the beauty but I guess the the good thing about where they were serving at Shaggy Ridge was that they had artillery, so they had the second fourth field regiment uh, deployed something like uh, 16 25 pounders guns down in the valley so they could support them they were always within range of those guns so they in fact they fought it wasn't it wasn't as it was similar but even different than the Kokoda campaign and they weren't advancing all the way to the coast they were just pushing up onto the mountain so they weren't that far from their support uh, and their supplies so it was a bit different in that regard but certainly operating in those mountains um, you know you you didn't want to be too heavily equipped um, as, as you say and by that time they'd also they'd got the new jungle greens and such so they were they were certainly better uh, in better shape than fighting when they went into battle. now you mentioned artillery well we we know that uh, in the for example in the Papuan campaign that it was something that the Japanese had an advantage over the Australian but how much of uh, an impact did artillery make in the jungles against the Japanese? And we're talking about, I guess, 25-pounders here, aren't we? Yeah, they're using 25-pounders. Um, so, I mean, it had an impact insofar as if they could spot a, um, a concentration of Japanese or Japanese artillery open fire, 
they would immediately open fire back on it. They also had uh, air, air observers in uh, RAAF, Wirraways and Boomerangs, who could observe the fall of shot, who could look for Japanese artillery pieces in the mountains and such. Um, the Japanese were very smart, though, because of the terrain, because it's so, like Razorback Ridges, they'd always dig in on the other side of the ridge, so they couldn't be hit by the artillery. So the artillery had its had its um, had its use, usefulness, -ness, but certainly not not the sort of usefulness it would have, like on the northern European plains or in the desert. And so tell us about the Japanese. What sort of positions are they preparing? Are they in defensive positions? Are they dug into the ground? Are they uh, have they spent much time doing any of this fortifications or anything like that waiting for the Australians? Or is it simply that they are out there in the jungle coming towards the Australians and fighting similar to what they would have in the Owen Stanleys? Uh, the Japanese is interesting because initially, after they'd lost those units down in the um, down the Kai pit, they were very weak. They were very weak. They originally sent a regiment in there, but they lost most of those fighting in the Rame Valley, so they were quite weak. Then they put in an early counter-attack on the Australian positions. It was basically a factor of holding the key. So the Australians were very quickly captured some of the key heights um, when they first moved on from Dumpu, like Kings Hill, heights, heights like uh, Feature 4100 and um, to 2nd 33rd Battalion captured. And then a, a key height called John's Knoll, which was uh, they captured and held. And this this was on what the Japanese had a supply route. It was basically a, a, a mule track. Not that they had mules, but they would they would be bringing their, their supplies down into the Ramia Valley. But once they realised they didn't have the forces then to push back into the Ramia Valley, they just took up key positions on these heights where a few men could hold off, you know, a company of men. So uh, at that stage, they started building, you know, the log bunkers and uh, well camouflaged log bunkers. And they certainly did that up on Shaggy Ridge. Um, dug themselves into the side of the hill on the opposite side of the hill so the artillery couldn't get to them. And, uh, yeah, they, so they, they captured some very strong positions and they, sorry, they made some very strong positions, but also they could hold these positions with a small amount of men, you know, 20 or 30 men against basically a battalion. Mm -hmm. And okay, so let's let's go through now, I guess, in, in order of the way it plays out on, on Shaggy Ridge, and then maybe we'll talk about some of the other individuals that fought up there but you know i remember uh, the first time that i went there being confused in the sense that we went through dumpu and uh, i camped at a small village before we left the next day to go on the walk i i did i couldn't I, I didn't have a clear sense of the direction when we were there the australian soldiers when they went there in 43 did they what what intelligence did they have did they know what they were going up for did, did they have a rough idea of of where, I mean, have we got aerial reconnaissance, intelligence that had come back in? They had maps, and they had maps they prepared from aerial reconnaissance. But um, it's a bit like, I was the same when I went there, David, it's very hard to get your bearings. Um, but once you, you know, they had the intelligence officer, I knew one of the, I, I knew the uh, Australian intelligence officer from the 2nd 27th Battalion very well. And he told me how important it was to produce maps. And if you look in their war diaries, you see a lot of hand-drawn maps and a lot of hand-drawn hand drawings of the terrain, and then they would name these features. So, for example, John's Knoll was obviously named after Bob John's. Pickin Ridge was named after the, next, the second seven, 27th Battalion Commander who came in after Bishop. Um, Pallias Hill was named after Noel Pallia after they captured it. King's Hill was named after the guy who captured it. And Shaggy Ridge was actually named after Bob Clampett, who was, um, his nickname was Shaggy, and he was the second 27th Battalion uh, platoon commander. So they would basically prepare their own maps and sketches and such. So they, they learned pretty pretty quickly how to do that. Um, but yeah, when they first went in there, they would be going up, for example, the first units that went in, they'd be following the rivers, uh, following the creeks up the, you know, into the jungle to, to, to find their way in there. And then the Japanese would ambush them from on top of the cliffs. And so they soon learned that that wasn't the way to go. You had to actually capture these high features if you wanted to progress. And that was the same with most of the war in New Guinea, and even if you look at Dakota, if you held those high features, the key features, even if you were counterattacked, you could um, you had the key ground. Yeah, and I guess for people who, and we don't expect listeners to get their head completely around the fighting on Shaggy Ridge in this in this talk, and I encourage them to do some reading and obviously also to get there one day when we can. But let's talk about now some of the uh, actions that were fought up there. Perhaps we'll talk about Kings and and uh, Kings and Pallia's Hill, and and maybe you have some, share some stories about some individuals that fought there. Yeah, look, look, Kings Hill and Pallia's Hill was a really interesting one for me because uh, Kings Hill was captured by Fard's battalion early on in the um, early on in the piece, and as you know, if you've been there, it's like a um, a pyramid. 
basically shaped like a pyramid with 45 degree slope right to the top. It's flat. There's a flat area on top, but it's all open. There's no there's no jungle on it. So it's a really punishing climb to get up there. Um, but once you're up there, there's this connecting ridge to another small knoll, which is further up, which runs along, uh, and the creek runs below that. And so when they first went up there, then the 2nd 27th was relieved by the 2nd 14th Battalion, the fellows who had been at Dakota, of course. So the 9th platoon went up there, and, and their platoon commander was a guy called uh, Noel Pallier. And I got to know Noel Pallier very well, and we talked a lot, and uh, I visited him, and he used to live in Wollongong. And, um, one morning they realised that the Japanese had come in overnight and captured this knoll along from where they were. So they got the job of going along this Razorback Ridge to recapture it um, that, that afternoon because they'd cut the supply line to the troops further forward, which is Mafia's battalion. So there was just a platoon of guys, um, but I, I interviewed quite a few of them, so I really got the story well. So there was Noel Pallier, he had his uh, platoon sergeant, was Lindsay Bear. His, uh, two of his uh, section commanders were um, Louis Whitechurch and Hayo Silver, who both fought at Kokoda. Uh, both would be awarded military medals for this action. And they they had to basically capture this position um, without getting, you know, without the Japanese who were on a dominating position getting to them. So they went around underneath the ridge uh, where the Japanese couldn't see them. And uh, on the area over from there is a guy called uh, Captain Stan Bissett. And anyone who knows Kokoda would know of Stan Bissett. And his brother and uh, Stan Bissett was the intelligence officer at that stage in the um, second uh, 14th battalion. He'd got up on this adjacent ridge and he'd got some biggest guns put, put up there. He'd got a biggest gun put up there and a mortar observer, and also he had artillery observer. So they could put artillery. They had, I think they had 19 rounds from this short 25 pounder down in the valley. They had mortars and they had the biggest gun, which kept the Japanese heads down while this platoon came along the ridge towards them. And they didn't realise the platoon was there until they were almost on top of them. And at that stage, they, they climbed up this. And if you've been up there, it's like it's almost 90 degrees at the end. It's a really steep rise. But uh, Teddy Bear led them over and uh, was seen from down below, you know, basically bayoneting Japanese and throwing them over his shoulder. And mm -hmm. the Japanese, a lot of them were off the ridge, totally scared of what was going on. And they captured that ridge. They lost a few men up there, but they um, they captured that position and reopened the supply line that night. So, as I say, I knew Noel Pally very well, and he, he we talked for hours about the battle. And uh, when the book came out, he rang me up and he said, "Philip, you were there," and that was the best compliment for me that I got the story across. Uh, wow, that, that's, that's amazing! It's amazing a compliment on on your work there. Uh, now. I just uh, would be reminiscent of me not to, and you probably get this question quite a bit, I guess, when you talk about Shaggy Ridge, but ha let's talk about another fellow, Tommy Roberts. How does an American flyer end up fighting with the 2nd 16th Battalion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tommy Roberts was an American photo reconnaissance pilot. Pre-war, he'd been a, um, a hunter guide out in Colorado, a real backwoodsman, and, a, and a, loved his rifles and shooting and, and hunting. And he'd met a fellow out there called David Hutchison, who later became a colonel in the US Air Force. And he was very well connected in New Guinea. So he got Tommy Roberts uh, after he'd done his flying training into the photo reconnaissance squadron. And Tommy said he wanted to go, uh, you know, wanted to serve in the front line with the Australians. So Dave, so Hutchison knew General Basie. So he convinced him that, to let this guy um, go up there and serve in the front line. And Basie agreed. So. This American turns up in the front line of the 2nd 16th Battalion with his Garand rifle and his hunting rifle and his, <laughs> <laughs> and his wild ideas. And, uh, yeah, he served up there with the front line platoon who happened to attack on the day of, uh, of the attack on the pimples. Um, uh, there's different stories about um, you know, whether he'd kill Japanese or not or he was just sitting behind, but um, he, was a, he was an adventurous type and he, he actually got to serve up with the Australians. And, about three weeks after that, he went missing on a, a flight, and his body's never been found. And uh, mm -hmm. I got to know his um, his brother very well. He showed me his rifles and such, from uh, and told me the story of Tommy. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real a nice uh, nice human story to add to the book, and just shows you the variety of um, variety of people in the uh, in the campaign. Yeah, as we talk, I'm looking in your book at the photo of him, and he looks he looks pretty happy with himself in that photo. I must say. Yeah, I, I think he was pretty happy to have uh, the opportunity to serve with the Australians up there, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And get some, and get some Japanese souvenirs, which, of course, the Americans loved. <laughs> yes. I want to move on now, Phil, if I may, and talk about going to the battlefield uh, now in yeah. modern times. 
what what I guess from your point of view, and I'm not taking away from Kokoda at all, but for people who have especially have interacted with New Guinea, it might be simply that they've gone and walked this, you know, thousands of Australians have gone and walked the Kokoda track now, but that might be their only interaction with Papua New Guinea. Tell us what what what, uh, what what's your impressions of going there, and 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 would you encourage uh, Australians to go and make this pilgrimage like they do Kokoda? Yeah, well, first, first time I went there was actually um, New Year's Day, nineteen ninety six, and I'd um, I'd managed to borrow a four wheel drive vehicle from work, and uh, and I got to know the local station cattle station over there. He took me up into the mountain, showed me the track up, but you can only drive a certain way in, and, and today you can't even do that. Um, but it was the old army road that, that they built in there. Uh, but once you start climbing that ridge and get up the top, it's it's, it's a really special place. Um, not just the battle. I mean, there's a lot left over from battle. There's there's a lot of you know, munitions up there and ox holes and everything still the same along the top of the ridge. Um, but it's 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 quite it's quite challenging in some ways because you need to take enough water up onto the ridge to uh, to get you along. But that's a day, and then you come down the other side, and then you walk back along the valley of the river. So it's a it's you get a quite a variety of the New Guinea uh, countryside, but the views from up there are spectacular. You can see as far as the north coast to the north coast, and then you can see down into the Ramu Valley on the other side and across the other side of the range, Mount Helwig, which is the um, and uh, these large mountains on the other side of the range, the Bismarck Range. Yeah, I mean that's you know, that's going up there is a fantastic thing to do. Yeah, I was, well, I think the views would have to arguably the views are much more amazing than going and trekking Kokoda. It's uh, amazing spot as you say phil what what you touched on about you know finding detritus you know in the bush there one thing that struck me and i went up as recently as september last year is that you, unlike kokoda because it's not as well traversed you 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 find lots of this stuff left over from the battle i've seen you know even australian shoulder titles up at uh, one of the proth rows there was australian uh, the, the medal australian badge and and you know like officers pistol ammunition there's there's heaps of stuff that you see up there is there anything on your journey up there that stood out Stood out that you found? I think the most interesting for me was um, the first time I went up, I went along the ridge and came down, and then the second time I did the same. The third time I actually I wanted to find this Japanese gun position, which, which um, caused something like 50, 50 60 Australian casualties um, at Point Blank Range up on Prothera. And... Um, this was in an area where the locals normally don't go, and it's constantly damp. It rains up there all the time. So I was really happy to find that position. I actually identified the exact position. The outline of it was clear in the ground, uh, and there was a Japanese helmet lying on the ground, so that's a special souvenir as well. But uh, finding that position, I think, was pretty special. Uh, unfortunately, because of the rain, we didn't. Uh, I had a day spare to dig it out, but uh, we just couldn't do it. It was just raining too much. But um, that was pretty special. The other thing was taking um, Teddy Bear's family back to where he, he's, uh, he'd won the DCM and um, they climbed up the ridge with me and uh, this is on Pallius Hill and uh, we took them to the same position where he, his father was basically wounded and Noel Pallier told him to, to roll away or he'd be killed and um, he said then to Noel, he said, I'll call my son after you and here I am with his son. Yeah. And there on, on this same forward trench which they captured was a... Um, an orchid. We've not seen an orchid or any sort of flower on that ridge. And they started crying. I said, why are you crying? And they said, because that was his favourite flower. Oh, wow. Um, as if he was talking to us. <laughs> oh, uh, well, things, like, things like that are pretty special. You, you, know, you can't put a price on it. Oh, no, you can't. And I think and you and I share that in the sense that we've been able to take immediate relatives onto the battlefields of New Guinea. That's a wonderful story. I, I, I got to know Noel and his wife, Jill, through the shrine when we had the anniversary exhibitions and you know wonderful people that want to carry on that story so that's amazing uh, experience that you had there what uh, is, now does there any other standouts of veterans that you interviewed or stories that you might want to want to recall to the listener back there to get them to wet their appetite if you will because i want them to go away after this and go grab a copy of your book and learn more about shaggy ridge well i think the um one of the interviews i was really happy with was a guy called uh, tom uh, pinky mcmahon he's a redhead and he was the first guy up onto the pimple when the 2nd 16th Battalion captured the pimple uh, just after Christmas in 1943. And um, at the time I talked to him, he was in a, uh, a nursing home and he didn't have, or a hospital, and he didn't have long, long but he, um, it, it was as if when I started talking to him, it took him straight back to being there. And uh, he was almost crying talking to me. And 
because he was up there on his own. The other fellas couldn't reach him. The, the, it was too steep and the Japanese were throwing grenades down. So it was as if he was there on that day. He said, where, where, are, my friend, where, where are my men? Where, where are you? So it was like uh, he was talking to me in his, uh, like in a dream. So that was pretty special. Um, there's another fellow who was a stretcher bearer uh, up on Prothero and he, had, um, he, he told me some very sad stories about people shooting other Australians, shooting other Australians at night because they were just so scared of the Japanese. Mm-hmm. So, that, you know. People were firing off bullets when they shouldn't have been, and um, so he, he talked about one of his mates who died up there, and that was pretty sad. And he told me to sleep that night, and I said, "I'm sorry." And he said, "No, no, I needed. I've spent what was it, 50 years trying to get this out." So um, when you get those sort of stories, I think they're pretty special. And I mean, all in all, for the book, interviewed about 150 vets, um, so I really got some great stories. Uh, just stories, but guys from the same unit. So you could get the true story um, by cross-referencing their accounts. And that was pretty important. I even took the second commander up on Shaggy Ridge, um, uh, Gen- who later became General Fraser, who later commanded forces in Vietnam. And um, talking to him, actually, because he'd never talked about this before. He'd always talked about Vietnam and such. So to have someone come in into his house and talk about Shaggy Ridge was, was pretty special to him. And um, just on the point of view, the... Um, the book on Shaggy Ridge is no longer in print, but I'm currently rewriting the book, and it will be out um, next year, later next year, a, a new, a new um, book, totally new book. Um, also includes a number of Japanese accounts. I've been very fortunate to obtain accounts of two Japanese people, or three Japanese men who are up there, detailed accounts of their battles. So we're cross-referencing the Australian Japanese accounts. It's really quite exciting to work with. It. And so that's the first time that'll be in print. So... Uh, that'll come out with Alan and Unwin later next year, hopefully. That that's wonderful news because I know that it is very your book on Shaggy Ridge has become quite collectible and sought after, and it is difficult to get. So this is going to be great news for people who I couldn't one couldn't find it, and and more importantly, I guess being able to give something for people to go out and buy that's relevant, and hopefully when we get out of this pandemic, we could get back up there and uh, and try and introduce some of this wonderful history to another generation of Australians. Phil, well, I really appreciate talking to you and I hope this has sparked the interest for people to learn more about Shaggy Ridge. But I'll finish up now with with your thoughts on how do you see the legacy of the fighting that went on in on Shaggy Ridge, but also in those latter campaigns up in New Guinea. Why do you think it's important for Australians to remember and also how do you see the remembrance continuing? Well, I think it's important to remember all our um, all our servicemen and what they've achieved um, and what they sacrificed. Um, so, you know, that's um, that's the bottom line with it. I mean, I've been very encouraged uh, working with a lot of the, the um, battalion groups and marching on Anzac Day with a lot of the, the descendants of these veterans and trying to keep their memory alive because it's worth keeping alive. And it's interesting, the last veterans are with us now, but... Um, uh, you know, I've talked, I was lucky to be talk, able to talk to them a bit. It's going back 20 years. And, and I know that as they got older, they realised that unless they told their story, their story would be lost. So um, by writing about them, I think I uh, hopefully um, progress that story. And um, as, as, you, as, as the book you know, the Hell's Battlefield book, which also covers a bit about Shaggy Ridge, I've tried to get in there the stories of, of all these battles, as well as Kokoda, but showing it as, as part of the bigger bigger picture in New Guinea because it, it went on from uh, well, basically 42 to 45 so you know it was three years before in New Guinea. Indeed, and we've had very much been able to provide a lot of our guys that go up to New Guinea with us with your book. And as you say, it's a great overview and a great way of getting people to put the whole involvement of us in New Guinea in a greater context, not just focusing on Kokoda. Phil, look, thank you very much for spending the time talking to us today. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll put up a link so people can get a copy of, of your book and we'll wait the publication of your of your next of your next one and I wish you all the best. Thanks, Simon.